it was a skill that I had built over years and years and years, not only through my graphic design career, but when I was in the wedding biz, I also had a blog at that time. And as kind of a marketing thing to promote my invitations, which was the product I was selling, on the blog, I would do a lot of inspiration posts and color palettes for weddings. Hey there, I'm Maya De Leon, and my mission is to help creatives like you translate what you love to do into a highly profitable income. I'm a mom of three who began as a lettering artist and grew it into a six-figure business. If I made it possible, so can you. Every week, we'll dive deep into topics like building your confidence, getting comfortable talking about money, and nurturing your passion while juggling life and family. So if you're an ambitious creative who wants to craft the life you love, get cozy, feel at home, and listen to The Confident Creator Show. Hey creators, it's a wonderful day today and I'm thrilled because someone special is joining us on the show. I met her in 2017 when I first launched my online lettering mentorship program. She was already an established graphic designer at the time. And you know what stuck with me? She never stopped growing and learning. She's a brilliant designer, illustrator, lettering artist, and Skillshare top teacher based in Atlanta, but originally from the sunny Barbados. She credits her island background for influencing the vibrant colors and lush florals and foliage she often incorporates into her work. Over her 20-year creative career, she has worked in corporate graphic design, run her own stationary business, and now focuses on licensing her art to product-based businesses. Welcome, welcome, my friend, Gia Graham. I am so excited that you're here. Thank you so much for giving us your time. Thank you for having me, (laughs) (laughs) It has been a while and it's super fun to have you on the show today. It's great to be here and it's nice to see you and chat with you again. Yeah, like how many times have we chatted since I I last have you in my masterclass? It's been really It's been a few times, but it's been a while since the last time we got to have a face-to-face chat. Yes, and it's good. It's so good to see you again. (laughs) They cannot see you. I can see you. So be jealous, (laughs) you you guys. (laughs) All right. So as we start the show, I would want to ask you, Gia, would you mind telling our listeners how your creative career started and how it evolved over the years? Okay. So I've always been a creative person. Um, I was one of those kids who knew what they wanted to do all the time. Um, So in high school, I knew I wanted to be in some kind of creative career, but I wasn't quite sure what that would be. A friend of mine, his dad was a graphic designer. So I was like, oh, okay, that sounds like it'll work. Um, Because it it felt like a career path rather than a quote unquote starving artist path, Mm -hmm. which was a big deal at that time. there weren't as many outlets for creatives at that time. Oh yeah, Um, tell me about it. (laughs) Yeah, so I went to college, got my degree in graphic design, did the whole corporate design thing for about six years. Um, That very quickly became uninspiring. Um, and And that's even during the graphic design heyday when you had giant budgets and they'd fly you out to on photo shoots and all of this, you know. Even with all of that, it, it for me, it got pretty uninspiring. And if I'm being totally honest, I didn't love working for other people. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you know? I feel that. There's, <laughs> yes. There's a lot of drama that comes with kind of inserting yourself into somebody else's culture. And I mean, like, their work culture, you know? So you don't have a whole lot of say on how things are done or how people are treated, you know, so I didn't love working for other people. So I decided to jump ship with a good friend of mine and we started our little custom invitation business, which was great. It was fun. Um, And we are both very, we complimented each other. We still compliment each other well, but 
in, in business, we complemented each other really, really well. Um, and we were very, I mean, this, we were in our twenties at the time and, you know, there were no kids. This was our <laughs> focus <Yeah. laughs> and we were really go-getters. We, I mean, we took our graphic design skills and built a business around that. So it looked super polished and pulled together, but you know, we were behind the scenes scrambling to figure out what we were doing. <laughs> like we always do. <laughs> exactly. That doesn't really change much, <laughs> but, um, but yeah, so, so we did that. Um, and at first we were very high end custom design. And then we realized that there was much more of a need for affordable pricing in, and this was specifically in wedding stationery. So then we shifted the kind of really hands-on custom stuff to an online offering. Well, to a catalog of designs that customers can pick from. Then um, I took, she got a really great job that she couldn't pass up. And I took that catalog des of designs and took it online. So that was my first kind of dipping my toes into the world of online stationery. And I did that for quite a while. Um, I think I put my website up. I want to say that was maybe 2008. Hmm. And so in 2008, there was no Shopify. There was no Wix. There was no Squarespace, <laughs> Squarespace. you know. <laughs> yeah. So not only did it cost an arm and a leg to put a, a e-commerce site up, but it was the most hacked together, <laughs> you know, <laughs> hodgepodge, just make it work kind of yeah. site, but made it work. And I did that for, uh, I don't know, maybe eight years. And then the, the wedding industry really shifted quite a bit. So that was my first, um, that was my first time as a solo entrepreneur mm -hmm. to have to make a decision to pivot. So what happened was a lot of big, well-funded um, online stationary companies started popping up on the scene and it made it much harder for independent artists to yeah. compete. And also what happened, as much as I absolutely love Pinterest, Pinterest made everything shift because when I had my um, wedding invitation business, that's when wedding blogs were really popular. Yes. And anybody getting married went straight to a wedding blog for ideas, for pictures, for tips, all of that. So it was really straightforward. You have your business, you pay for an ad on a few of the top wedding blogs, you get customers. Yeah. Like, I did easy that too. Daily, <laughs> you know, and the return on investment was definitely there. It was absolutely worth it. But what started happening was Pinterest came along and nobody wanted to sit and read a blog post. They just, you know, it's easier to go to Pinterest and just scroll pretty pictures. So the blog started to kind of dwindle, but their advertising fees were going up, I guess, because, you know, they were fighting to stay alive too. Mm -hmm. So then the return on investment just wasn't there to pay for advertising on a blog that wasn't getting any traffic. So I was like, you know what, this isn't working. So I decided to um, shift to everyday stationery. I came out of the wedding world and I decided to start a line of greeting cards. And I did that in 2000. I officially launched it in 2014 um, and started selling wholesale to other retail stores. So I had my cards in shops around the country did that for about I guess it was two years because it was 2016 that I decided to leave that behind when my second son was born and I had to stay home with him because he was premature and daycare really wasn't an option it wouldn't have been safe for him to go to daycare with his little tiny lungs oh, um, yeah. yeah because I mean he spent two months in the NICU in the hospital. And even when he came home, he was only four pounds. So, you know, I'm not sending my four pound baby. <laughs> I to know, daycare. I get that. The <laughs> twins are two pounds each. Oh my God. What, my, he was two pounds when he was born, too. Oh, yeah. 
Yeah. <laughs> I didn't realize your girls were that tiny. Oh, they were super tiny. 31 weeks when I gave birth to them. Yeah, he was 28 weeks. Two oh, pounds, too young. two ounces. Yeah. yeah, he was really, really early. And so he stayed in the hospital for two months and gained two more pounds, <laughs> but still was so tiny when we brought yeah. him home, you know? So yeah, I didn't want anybody sneezing on him in daycare. So I decided <laughs> to stay home with him and just kind of leave the business behind. Mm -hmm. Because really, when you're faced with that kind of decision, it's pretty easy to say, okay, that is not worth, you know, yes, the risk. my kids' yes. health, you know? So I was home with him and not going to lie, bored out of my mind. <laughs> I needed a creative outlet. I had to have it, you know? And so I had always had a love for lettering. And I was always one of those like, oh, I wish I could do that. Because the funny thing about having a creative business where it's product-based is 90% of your time is spent doing everything except creating. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so it, you know, even though I had a creative business and I was putting out greeting cards constantly, I really didn't have the time to explore and try new things. And I didn't have any of the time for that. So it was only when I was home and bored out of my mind that I was like, oh, maybe I should give this hand lettering a try. It's been years. I've been wanting to kind of see what that's like. So I got an iPad, I got an iPad and then right around, I think maybe the year before the iPad Pros came out, it was pretty close to when the iPad Pros came yeah, out. Yeah, lucky and you. Like, <laughs> yeah, it, the timing was great. So I was like, maybe this thing could work because, you know, I had been using my computer, using Adobe Illustrator primarily. And the Wacom tablet, do you, did you use yeah, that? Yeah, I had a I had a Wacom tablet, but not the really expensive, fancy one where you can draw. Oh, the Cintiq. I didn't have the, that. Yeah, too. I didn't have a Cintiq. <laughs> so the, with the other type, I just, my brain did not like it. Where you were <laughs> drawing on a blank space, but looking up at your screen. Exactly, exactly. That's also the reason why I never used mine. I had two, but never yeah. used both of them. I, I, I probably could count on two hands, how many times I pulled that thing out because it was so counterintuitive. I was like, this does not work for me. <laughs> and honestly, I didn't have the patience to push through to get it to work for me. Yeah. So, so yeah, so I was using Adobe Illustrator and just the, the, the lure of being able to draw with my hand, but it being digital just drew me in. I was like, okay, I have to try this. But I had the iPad for close to a year before I did anything with it. Oh, so fine. yeah, I think I, I got the iPad in 2017 and it just yeah. sat because I, because I was so ingrained in vector artwork yes. because that's since college, that was all I was doing. That's all I knew. And I was like, raster files are just not going to be good enough. <laughs> and, you know, I came up with the industry strand the industry standard being vector art you send vector files to your printer you send you know anything you do you're delivering vector art so innately I thought uh I don't know if this is going to be good enough quality to work with and I don't know so I, it sat my iPad sat for almost a year before I started using it then I think through Instagram, I discovered Procreate <laughs> and yes. I was like, well, I'm just going to play. I'm, I'm not thinking about sending files to printers. I just want to play. So in 2018, I was like, okay, I'm doing this. I'm going to try this lettering thing. You know, it's just for me. So it doesn't matter if it's just, you know, raster files, who cares? It's just for me. And Lauren Holm had started her... Um, home sweet home challenges. Yeah, right at the same time. So the this homework, was January. Right? The homework. Yeah, her homework challenges. Right, and so this was January two thousand eighteen. So right at the same time, that was starting up, and I was like, "This is perfect. This will give me a reason to practice something." You know, a nudge. So I started that, and 
it was so new at the time that it was very easy to connect with other people who were doing the challenges. You know, it was a little group of people yeah. and we would comment on each other's too. work. And I also had a challenge you know? there. <laughs> yeah. And I remember, and that's how I discovered you actually, because you ran one of the challenges. I hosted one challenge month. number 13. Yeah. Oh, it was that early on. <laughs> yes, it was really Wow. On. I didn't realize it was that early on. So yes, I distinctly remember that. And for me, that one was so fun with all the different <laughs> styles because it was just so new to me. So I was like, oh, I could do one piece with all these different styles. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, that's when my lettering practice began. And so after discovering you through that challenge, I think maybe a few months later, you did your mentor. Yeah, I opened my yeah. mentoring, uh, lettering mentoring program. That was my yes, first so online course, girl. Was it? <laughs> that was... That oh my was goodness. my first offering online. So it's funny because I was uh, I was talking to Lauren at the time as well. And she was we had a, like a one on one before, like we were chatting and Lauren um, uh, was doing the passion project. So yeah. at the time, I thought like, oh, my goodness, am I going to be able to pull this off? Nobody know, like I don't feel like I'm as famous as Lauren home before. Like I, <laughs> Lauren is a good friend, but, you know, she is really well known in the industry. And I'm I felt like the imposter syndrome happens to all right. of us. So it felt yep. like, oh, my goodness, I don't think I'm going to be able to pull it off. And then 19 of you registered and I made my first five figures. Yeah. In a week. And I was like, holy cow, this is possible. <laughs> <laughs> so if that was possible, it is it is possible for everybody. Like, I only have, I don't know, how many followers do I have at a time? I think uh, I launched the book already. So it's about 13,000 followers or 14,000. Mm -hmm. But still, compared to Lauren and so many other famous artists like Stefan, Ian Bernard, and my friend yeah. Scotty. So those are like, Oh, I really felt like I'm not enough, but it happened. Yeah. So I just trusted yeah. my gut and it's everything <laughs> like Lauren just said, go, go for it. And yeah. yes. So after that, I was like, oh, go thank you so much. Like she really, yeah. really helped me push through it because if not, I might have like uh, doubted myself for a long time and sit on it for a while. But yeah. thankfully I have good friends around <laughs> and they really Absolutely. helped me push forward oh my goodness yeah I, I mean we could talk about this for an hour because yeah. <laughs> that can. is so major to have people around you who are not just creatives but creatives who care about you enough to help shove you off that ledge yes you know exactly. and to remind you to get out of your own head and to remind you of what your value is you know, like you have what it takes to do this mm -hmm. because, and we'll talk, of course, we'll talk about this later, but that's really how I got into teaching on Skillshare is my creative friends were like, do it. And I was like, yeah. just like the same way you felt like, no way. I am not a teacher. <laughs> I could never, who's going to take this class? How do I even teach this? All of those thoughts were there. And who would have thought that, given how I was feeling at that time, that a year later, I would be a top teacher on Skillshare? I know. You know? That was really, really amazing when I saw that. I was like, oh my goodness, Gia has really evolved <laughs> through these years. And it's super amazing to watch and see you grow. Thanks like so much. But that goes back to the whole thing of, you know, number one, not doubting your abilities, but number two who you surround yourself with yes. really makes a difference. If you have those people around you who can see your skill set, your talents, your, you know, a little kernel of something great and they push you, you know, there's so much wonderful stuff on the other side of your comfort zone. It but is true. You, yeah. You've got to be around people who can, you know, kind of help you push through your yes. own doubts. Yes. Always. So, yeah. So you and Lauren are to thank for the fact that I even have a lettering career because I did that mentorship with you and it was so helpful and it was great to have your one-on-one -on -one feedback. That was huge. And I just, it just really, all of these things kind of coming together lit a spark for me 
And I just have not stopped with lettering since. I know. And it was funny. I remember you at the time. You were ready to give up your foliage. Your- yes. <laughs> yes. That's true. And you were like, what? Because I, okay. So my thought, I love drawing the flowers and everything. And you would do these prompts. And I was like, well, I don't want to have flowers on everything. That's just, it'll be so boring. Nobody wants to see that. And <laughs> my was like, Put the flowers on everything. <laughs> Put the flowers on it because that's what's going to make your artwork unique. I think I was saying it like consistently like that because I yes. loved it. And if I loved it, I'm pretty sure a lot of other people are going to love it as well. And if there are people who doesn't like it, fine. Not everybody's going to like your work, but that's fine. It, it's so true. And you know what example you gave me? You gave me the it's a living example. <laughs> yeah. I don't know if you guys listening. Ricardo. Um, Yeah, it's Ricardo. Yes, Ricardo. His, it's a living Instagram account where he would usually spray paint. It's a living in a thousand different iterations over and over again. And I mean, his account is enormous and he has such a fan base. And when you showed me that, I was like, oh, okay. It's a thing. Now I understand. (laughs) Yes, it's a thing. (laughs) it's a thing like it really happens like when you do something really really good and repetitively you have got to get your reps out there before you really get good at something that is and that is it too and that's what I discovered over the years is you you even though we as creatives love the idea of dabbling like oh I want to try this and I want to try this and I want to try that that is fine but your proficiency does not come until you've done that one thing repeatedly. repeatedly. Exactly. Over and over. And that goes for whether it's a style or just lettering in general. Like if you pick up the iPad or pencil and paper and you're like, oh, I'm going to do lettering. And you do it for two weeks or two months or even six months. And then you're like, eh, I'm on to the next you're not going to gain the proficiency. You're not going to really develop your skill like you would if you do it consistently. And I think that that's what kind of eludes a lot of people Mm, is they kind of dabble and it's not easy. Lettering is not easy. It's not something that you're going to get just by the snap of a finger. And then when, you know, after a few weeks, they don't quite get the results. They're like, yeah, and they move on. (laughs) But You've got to stick to it. Just put those 10,000 hours in or however many it is that they say you need to put in before you really get good. Yeah. And I always tell everybody, like I have been practicing, practicing for two years and I get calluses all with in all of my fingers. Mm -hmm. Like I have washi tapes all over my fingers (laughs) as proof. (laughs) Like this is how hard I have been working on my lettering and I'm super obsessed with my perfection line perfecting the lines because when I was starting I was like oh my goodness this is crazy my lines are super imperfect they're so jagged it's not like all of these famous lettering artists they are not pretty at all but I still Mm -hmm. shared those and it's funny why because I ask everybody like if you're looking at my work right now stop and go scroll down at the bottom of my feed, look down and see how ugly the first works were. Because that's yeah. when you will realize this this that does takes a lot of time. And I really Absolutely. zone in and practice on my inking because that was the very thing that I thought was going to help me really get noticed out there. Because I want like I want my lettering to look like it's printed on computer (laughs) yeah that has always been the biggest uh, motivation for me when people tell me it looks like it's been printed on the computer but the funny thing is when I was doing all of those lettering work I was actually taking pictures and inking on top of the finished artwork (laughs) just so I could have those photos because when you're creating content it's not as appealing to have something that isn't finished maybe it is but right I am so obsessed with having it finished, done first before I take photos. And then I will ink over it. And then before I realized, I was like, oh my goodness, it's prettier when I ink on top of a finished work already. So (laughs) I would obsess over re-inking all of my hand lettering work for hours. That's how crazy I was. (laughs) And now I'm paying for it. Look at my neck and shoulders like, oh Oh. my goodness. (laughs) 
But yeah, it was super fun. And that is only, you only realize a lot of things when you consistently do it. Like, it's okay yep. to play and explore. We can always do that. We do that when we are starting. But if you want to learn and be proficient at one thing, you've got to stop for a while and see the pattern. Which one is really resonating with me best? Which one am I gravitating to every time that I do work? And maybe I should focus yep. on that. Because that is also when exactly. I realize, like, I was in Lila Rogers' class before. And she has a lot of prompts. Like, every week we have prompts, draw patterns, draw mm -hmm. for... um um. I don't know, kitchenware or something. Like, yeah. And in all of the assignments that she will give us, I will always end up with a lettering on it. And that's when I yeah. saw, I don't need to do all of those prompts. I'm just going to stop. <laughs> <laughs> really, I stopped. Like, I just, I am in a group witnessing how everybody is progressing and I'm just focusing on my hand lettering work. And I don't care if everybody else is progressing really, really fast with illustration. I'm not an illustrator, like a great, great illustrator. The only thing I know mm -hmm. how to illustrate is letters. <laughs> <laughs> hey, that counts. <laughs> and I was pretty good at it. <laughs> right. And that's true too. It's that kind of recognizing um, or kind of following what it's calling you, yeah. you know, recognizing it first of all, and then following it. Because I think it's probably the imposter syndrome. A lot of us do that where there's something that we keep coming back to over and over again, mm -hmm. but then we disregard it. You know, we're like, oh yeah, but, but I'm, I, I want to learn how to do this. <laughs> and then you kind of, kind of slide back to that one thing and then you disregard it again. But that's super important too. What you just said is recognize what it is that keeps pulling you back and then just focus on that because clearly that is a passion of yours. Yeah, you know? funny you said that because when I was scrapbooking, I would always create pieces of lettering work and I'd say, yeah, I can do it with my scrapbook, but it's not something that will really help me make money. Exactly. Do you remember that? Like, I yes. don't know, there's no money with this. So how can I make money with hand lettering? I'm not going to do that. I'm just going to incorporate a couple of things in my scrapbook pages and it's good. And then look at us. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's, it's how insane. ironic, right? That, that yeah. we have to go through all of these stages in life. Now, I didn't know that we almost have the similar circumstance when... We discover hand lettering again because in yeah. my case, it was Alphonse. And like you, I am bored to death. Like, <laughs> am I going to have enough every afternoon of the day? Oh my goodness, is this going to be my life forever? <laughs> and I was throwing a tantrum like a kid and my husband would always follow me in the bathroom. for th When I go to the bathroom at three hours in the morning, he would be following me like a crazy person. Are you okay? Or is it because yeah. he, he can hear me crying sometimes like I'm blaming, my, blaming myself for not being able to do anything I was I don't want to admit that but I was I think on the verge of depression but it's not really yeah. like a clinical diagnosis so I'm not yeah. saying it I don't want to say it so lightly mm -hmm. but yeah I was super super sad at the time <laughs> and I'm feeling yeah. like oh I'm not doing anything anymore that's what I felt even though I'm super busy with the kids and getting him to his to his appointments and everything, therapies, and then prepping the girls in the morning. I felt like I'm doing nothing because it's and not for me, thing. right? Exactly. And that's the thing is I think a lot of the times we as women in particular are by society made to feel guilty <laughs> yes. for not feeling like motherhood is enough. That is, oh, that is yeah. all we need is is to dote on our babies <laughs> and that's all we need in life. And that is, I mean, I adore them. I would do anything for them, yeah. but I need my thing, you yes. know, staying home all day long is just not for me. I mean, I mean, I, I work from home all day long, but <laughs> staying home and doing the laundry all day long, oh my goodness, I, I would absolutely lose it. I absolutely have to have a creative outlet. And most, I mean, there are some moms who are perfectly fine to just do that all day, you know, do the laundry, take care of the kids, all that. Yeah, that's we don't where have they find that. It's, it's just yeah, that, that we are that, different. If that's <laughs> your passion, go for it. That is not my passion. <laughs> 
<laughs> my and passion is I, to also, you know, get myself create, out there and create something for me. Exactly. And then the other thing you have to also realize or or you have to get attuned to who you are as a person. And you yeah. have to really understand yourself, not what everybody or society expects you to be, but who are you as a person? I know for me, number one, I'm an introvert. So that doesn't mean that I'm shy. It means I need downtime to re-energize myself. So that means that it's better for me if my kids go off during the day (laughs) to school or wherever, and I can just have a moment of you know, non, no nonstop chatter, no nonstop interaction. I can just kind of get into my quiet headspace and do what I need to do, whether that's create or whatever. But for me, I need that quiet headspace. So for example, <laughs> the kids have been home since March. Oh yeah. Tell me about it. You that. can imagine how I am losing my mind. Not because I don't want to be with them, but I have not been able to have that downtime. Yes, exactly. Ever. You know, it's unless I stay up really late and just kind of can get a little serenity and peace (laughs) and kind of recharge my battery. It's non-existent. So, so yeah. So for me, I know that I need, you know, some downtime and I am a better mom when we have a little bit of time apart, you know, (laughs) because I can recharge my battery to be a better, more patient person. Um, And I also know for myself that creativity is something that I absolutely need. You know, it's just how my brain is wired. So each person has to figure out who they really are at the core of themselves, you know, Mm. and Mm. kind of build your life accordingly. Yeah, so true, so true. Because I have not been doing hand lettering for two years now since I was uh, diagnosed with this myofascial. Well, I did one. The last one I did was Happy New Year in 2020. (laughs) And I paid for that for two months. Like I have been suffering for neck and shoulder pain for two months. And I had to go to therapies. <clears throat> and that was super painful. <laughs> but oh my goodness. So during like after the lockdown, of course, I was I was under the impression that, oh, I can do this. I have been working home for the longest time already. I can handle the kids being at home. Like I don't have to wake up at five in the morning to prepare them for school and whatnot. And then as months go by, I was like, oh, it's not yet over. <laughs> like I need my me time. So yes. without that creativity outlet, I turned onto plants. So I hoarded. Oh my gosh. <laughs> so did I. <laughs> did you? <laughs> I hoarded a ton of plants. And then my friend said, oh my goodness, you have beautiful babies because I was arranging them in a manner that's so pretty because yeah, <laughs> I don't yeah. want the leaves. I don't want the leaves brown or, you know, <laughs> I don't want them damaged or stuff. But, you, you know, plants are not perfect. They're not like shoes or something that right. you buy from a store and then bring it home like super perfect. It's not like that. Plants have yeah. imperfections. And that's what I've learned. That was... A, I have learned over these past few months, but it's funny that I have turned into a plant mom, knowing that I have a black thumb. (laughs) You know what is so hilarious? And I don't know if there's some bigger psychological reason for this, but I did the same. You did? Yeah. In June, no, March, April, in whenever it was, I've lost track of all time. (laughs) But I didn't (laughs) know what time it is either. Yeah. When, when we had been on lockdown for in quarantine for a couple of months, I was like, you know what? And it started getting warmer. We were coming out of winter season. I was like, you know what? I'm going to do something with the backyard. I'm going to plant a garden. Mm-hmm. And cause you know, I was looking around and I'm like, Oh, this patch, there's nothing here, but weeds. Let me do. And I have become obsessed with gardening. Yeah. <laughs> I think part of it is 
first of all, it's super stress relieving. So yes, even though I can't have that distance, you know, from other people, which introverts need, (laughs) I can't have that distance, but what's been working for me is just getting in the garden. Just there's something so literally grounding about it, you know, taking care of plants, watering them every day, watching them grow, you know, just, yes, it's been, plants have been a lifesaver. Have you been, have you been wiping the leaves of the plants with (laughs) Nemo? Because I do that. I discovered the whole neem oil thing a couple of weeks ago and I was like, ooh, I have to add that to the rotation. <laughs> I do that. Like, I don't want them dusty and I want them clean and shiny and nice. So I wipe them with neem oil, the dil- diluted neem oil. <laughs> don't, yeah. wipe, don't wipe it with pure ones because that's going to destroy the plant. So wipe it with okay, diluted to, neem oil. I need to add that to, the, <laughs> to my rotation for the indoor plants. Yeah, for and sure. I killed eight fiddly figs before I was able to. <laughs> See, now you're brave to even go the fiddle leaf route because I'm like, that's one plant I refuse to buy because <laughs> I know for a fact that I would kill it. <laughs> <laughs> and the funny thing is I am not giving up. We will be moving to the new house in a month from now. So I, my yeah. husband is like, I'm still going to get that one. And I am going to, you know, redeem myself because he's the he's, he has the one with a green thumb. I kill every plant there is. But <laughs> <laughs> now I'm better at it. Like I still have my syntopsis. All of them are yeah. still thriving and doing well. Yes. Uh, the begonia is melted. <laughs> 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 well, I saved the black mamba and the one rex. So I don't know. But the funny thing is, this has all given us a chance to be creative in a yeah. way, even though we have kids at home. And yes. I thought, really, I thought that I was going to be able to handle it super, you know, really, really going to be awesome about that. But no, it's not. Over time, as the yeah. kids like are here all the, t- all the time, it will drive you crazy. So you have got, <sighs> as a mom, get to have a creative outlet so that you can stay sane and be yep. productive and feel like you you own yourself again. Exactly. Oh my gosh. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. I told you this and is I going have... to be a fun episode, you guys. <laughs> <laughs> so how has it been like uh, live with you since you started all of this? I'm going back to whatever topic we were on before we get into oh, the right. plan. <laughs> we went on a massive tangent. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, sorry, you guys. It's just that how G and I talk like all the time. So I know that you girl have an amazing eye for colors. I have seen that in your work and I've always loved your monthly palette play. And so many people have been using it around the world today and joining your you you created a challenge out of it, right? So mm-hmm. how did it start and Did it somehow influence your Instagram growth? You know, I think it did, actually. So it started out of my um, obsessive compulsive type A personality. (laughs) Where So that first year, 2018, when I was really just kind of getting my feet wet with lettering and trying a lot of different things. um, At the end of the year, I did the top nine and those nine... Um, posts that they put up in a little grid were so haphazard. Nothing looked like it, it just didn't look like it came from the same person. And we changed it, right? <laughs> yeah. And part of that was because I was still developing my style. Yes. But part of it was that everything was so completely different. And because I like things to look organized and beautiful, I was like, we do. 2019's top nine has got to look better than this. <laughs> How, what can I do to make that happen? So I figured the best way to do that was with color because I was still exploring my lettering. So I didn't want to pigeonhole myself into one particular style or subject matter. Yeah. So I figured the best way to create a cohesive look was with through color. And that's probably part of my graphic design brain kicking in. Um, kind of just thinking ahead to what the end product would look like and then just 
figuring out the best way to solve that puzzle. So I decided to do it with color and I was going to create a new palette every month and do all my work in that palette for the month. And it was really just a personal project. I didn't think anybody would have any interest. And I just mentioned it on Instagram because I was like, hey, I'm doing this thing. If you notice that I'm going to be using the same colors every post, this is why. And a couple of my Instagram friends, um, a lot of them who I met through the homework challenges, were like, oh, what a good idea. Can I do it too? So then I said, okay, well, I'll share the colors and the hex codes for the colors and invite other people if they want to use them to go ahead and use them. And I, I may end one of, um, was it Mallory? One of the, my um, Instagram friends was like, you should do a hashtag. And I was like, really? Does, does anybody care? And she's like, <laughs> do a hashtag. Yeah. So I did the hashtag and surprise, surprise, people started joining in. It took so off, I didn't, really, right? Yeah. I didn't realize that color was such a pain point for people. You know, I wasn't doing it because I needed to figure out how to work with color. I was just doing it because I wanted my feet to look pretty. <laughs> <laughs> But as I started doing it, I would get all of these comments about how it was so helpful to have a palette already made and how do you get your pal your colors to work so well together and how do I make a good palette? So all of that started to kind of bubble up to the surface. Um, and in terms of Instagram growth, I think after a few months, my feed did start becoming more cohesive mm -hmm. and it kind of goes back to that thing with um, that we were talking about with putting the flowers on everything or doing the same thing repetitively. Yes. That repetition started to, I guess, gain some attention and my, my Instagram account started growing. So um, I think by so this was 2019. I started doing it in January of 2019. By March of 2019, I got fe um, a feature on Good Type. I got a feature on the Procreate Instagram account. So I guess because my grid was starting to look mo more cohesive, it lent more, I hate to use the word validity, but it, it just put my work in a different light, I yeah. guess. And that started getting attention from other people. So that's when I started getting more features. And then that in turn grew my account. And then that in turn brought more features. And then, so that's how the growth started. And early on, actually, it, I want to say by maybe the second or third month, another Instagram friend, Hazel, um, Hazel K letters. She was the one who was like, you know, I think you should teach a class. And I was like, I don't know how to teach a class. What are you <laughs> talking about? How do I even do that? And she was like, well, the next time you built, I mean, this conversation was two years ago. I don't remember exactly how it went, but in a nutshell, she said, the next time you put together a palette, think about how you did it. Like think rather than just doing it intuitively think about your steps and reverse engineer a class around it. So I was like, oh, that's kind of a good idea. So that was actually the very first time I thought about what I was doing as I was doing it. Yeah. And it's so weird because you become you more don't conscious know what about you, it. Yeah. It was completely unconscious and it, it was a skill that I had built over years and yes. years and years not only through my graphic design career, but when I was in the wedding biz, I also had a blog at that <laughs> time. And as kind of a marketing thing to promote my invitations, that, which was the product I was selling, on the blog, I would do a lot of inspiration posts yeah. and color palettes for weddings. So like I would have one of my invitations in a, in a kind of a flat lay scenario and then pull pictures of florals or dresses or whatever and build a palette around all of that. And you and I would put that on Pinterest and on my blog to inspire brides to pull together a whole look and also to sell my invitations. Yeah. You know, like <laughs> this invitation would work beautifully with this palette. 
So I had been building palettes back then too, as kind of a marketing ploy to push my business. So doing it in this scenario on Instagram and building the palettes for that was a culmination of a lot of years of experience that I almost didn't even know I had, you know, it, it just became part of my process. Yes, it was automatic. We're doing it like you have been, you have reached the point of automaticity that it becomes like normal. You don't exactly. think about it. You just put the exactly. colors in and out and then it's there. But now exactly. that you have a class, you have to put in more effort into consciously thinking, how does this all go and fit well together? Funny, right? It's so true. So I really had to kind of dig into myself and be like, okay, what am I doing? How am I doing it? How do I explain this to somebody else? Yeah. And in going through that process, I realized, oh, I do have a system. Oh, there is a way that I, I do this. And so I built that and turned that into a class. Now, mind you, from the time I had that conversation with Hazel to the time that I put the class out, was many, many months because <laughs> I still had that imposter syndrome. Like, I'm not a teacher. I do not teach. I am not built for teaching, you know, and who is really going to be interested in this? And then after I kind of worked my way out of that self-doubt, then the perfectionism kicked in. So I got on Skillshare and I read every single article <laughs> before I actually did anything. I read everything. I read what they're looking for, how to build a class. What is the structure? I watched other people's classes, making notes. So, you know, then, so that's just another way to stall. You know, that's another way to procrastinate yeah. and not do the thing that you really need to do. So I did that for months. And then I was like, you know what? This is ridiculous. I need to just do it. So I finally pieced together my first class and it was on color um, palettes, how to build a color palette. And I explained my process for doing it. And then, you know, the whole Skillshare thing took off from there. Yeah. And now you are a top teacher on Skillshare. Yeah. That is super <laughs> amazing. I'm super, super proud of you. Like, Thank you, Mai. Oh, my goodness. Like you have achieved so many things in such, oh, to, I would say in such a short period of time. But it's not really short. Like it's right. It, it was that's years. exactly <laughs> it. And and that's the other thing I try to always remind people of. I mean, I've been in design for 21 years. Yeah. You know, so a, a lot of people are just seeing this little sliver of the journey. And it seems like it was fast, but like we talked about, there is so much experience and work that kind of gets tossed into the pot. That when, you know, your gumbo is finally made, it's like, oh, that only took a couple of hours. But no, really, it's it's been bubbling for a very long time. Yes, exactly. It's like learning a recipe, right? When you learn a recipe, mm -hmm. even though you have all of the ingredients, you really will not be able to achieve the same taste and texture, whatever, of that person who shared the recipe with you unless you yep. repeatedly do it. Yeah, right? that's true. And that's the other thing, too, that I think people get really sidetracked about is they look at other people's success mm -hmm. and, and they feel as though they can use that same formula. But it doesn't work like that. You know, everybody's like journey is going to be different. You know, everybody has their own gifts and their own set of experiences that will come into play. So, yeah, it, it's great to be inspired by other people, but just remember that First of all, what you're seeing is just a part of their journey. And secondly, they're, they're going to take turns and their road is going to twist in different ways from yours. So, you know, just keep, keep on walking. Yeah, and keep on doing you. Like I always say, I think I have this post the other day. I said, keep like doing you, for, following your path first and creating for yourself. Because once you do that, it's going to be a lot more fun for you. And yep. those who follow you, that's the people you serve. Don't try to exactly. chase people who are not really into what you are creating. And then you'll create artwork for their sake. 
It's not yes. going to work like that. It's it's going to burn you in the long run. It's not going yep. to be fun. And that's the thing. It, creativity, you do have, it ebbs and flows. And there will be times where you feel burnout or you feel uninspired. So adding a layer to that of not doing something that really drives and fulfills you, yeah. those burnout periods are going to be way worse, you know? So and you longer. have to start at a point. <laughs> yes. You have to start at a point of love, passion, enjoyment. You know, you have to be in it and love what you're doing. Otherwise, when it gets hard, you're just going to bail, you know? Yeah. So what do you do when you feel like you're, you need a break or you're too stressed to work? What do you do? The, This actually happened just this week. Um, so I'm working on some stuff for my agent. And this particular set of pieces is not necessarily right in my wheelhouse. So, oh my gosh, I struggled this week. I struggled <laughs> so hard. And it just was not coming. And I'm like pushing and pushing and pushing to get this one piece to work. And it was not working. And yesterday, I just set it aside and I did some coloring. I got out <laughs> with color pencils. I did some coloring. I did some sketching for stuff that was just for fun, completely unrelated to the project and deadline that I have to work on. <laughs> so I just unplugged from that one thing, you know, and just let my brain rest. And I felt so much better by the end of the day. Now, I try not to unplug from creativity completely because I find that when I walk away altogether and I just set my iPad away aside and I don't do anything creative for an extended period, I find it's actually much harder to jump back in. Yeah. That so true. complete disconnection for, for, for me anyway, it, it just makes it really harder to plug back in. So rather than disconnecting from being creative completely, I just disconnect from that one thing. Yeah. And I keep my creative wheels turning in other ways. And, and once I feel a bit refreshed or the frustration has dissipated, then I come back to it. And usually it clicks. Okay. So we're doing different things. For me, I stay away from all creative work, like all of it. And mm -hmm. then... But I do non-creative things. I cook. I don't know if that's creative. <laughs> I it cook. is, though. I walk uh -huh. to the park with the kids, at least. When we were in Singapore, now there's no place to walk around here. We're just walking inside the house. So I tend right. to the plants. <laughs> mm -hmm. So I stay away from creativity. And then, oh, usually that takes a week. And then mm. after that, on my second week, I will slowly get into it again by listening to creative podcasts. That's just the way how I was wired. Like, I don't try mm -hmm. to push something if that doesn't work for me because I'm not going to like it. And I'm still right. going to end up not doing that. Right. <laughs> yes. So why yeah. fight it? Just give in to it and then yeah. get back to it with full energy, refreshed, new ideas and stuff like that. And you see, even though we're both doing creative things, We like we stay away from things differently. Like we recharge right. dif differently. You don't stay away from the entire creative work. You just do something different creatively. Yeah. Me, yes. I stay away cr fully away from creative work, yeah. and that has worked well for me. So find yeah. your own groove and just do it. Yeah, right? Absolutely. Oh, and that goes back back to kind of really paying attention to your personality and knowing who yes, you are yes, and figuring true. out what will work best for you because it's different for everybody. Yes, yes. Oh my goodness. I hope we have another hour for this. <laughs> But the, <laughs> oh my gosh, an hour has flown hour by. Has, yeah, it has flown by so fast. But before we go, I've always been asked this question whenever I guest on the podcast. But this time, oh my goodness, I'm doing the honor of throwing you this question. Okay. <laughs> It's for a change. So yeah. given that you have successfully managed them both, what advice would you give our listeners who are struggling about balancing time for work and family life? Like you have been good at both. Ooh, so tell us about I, it. Though, my, 
Oh, well, that's what I see it from my perspective. I don't know what's going on inside, but maybe you can share and shed a bit of light about it. No, to be to be honest, particularly now with this whole COVID pandemic, oh, this yeah. whole thing, which has just thrown everything completely off, I really struggled with the balance for a while, for a few months. I feel as though I'm in a I've kind of figured out my groove now. Mm -hmm. So I kind of have to block my days. So fortunately, my husband is also working from home. So at least I have a partner to help. So what we've done is we've kind of blocked off our days. I have mornings with the kids. So I do virtual school with them and all of that. And after lunch, that's my creative time. It also helps that we have a little home office studio in our backyard. So the separation is there. Oh, I want that. <laughs> <laughs> it Listen, I worked out of my house for, I don't know, a good decade. And that's something I really struggled with was the separation. Because I would walk past my computer, you know, walking from the kitchen or whatever, you know, it was constantly there. So it was very difficult for me to unplug. So after all of those years, my husband and I were like, we need a separate space because this is not working for us anymore. So I know that I'm very fortunate to have this little cocoon because I walk out of my back door, cross the deck <laughs> and in here it's silence and I can actually focus. So Obviously, everybody doesn't have that. But if there is a way to carve out like a space for yourself where you can kind of make that shift to your own creative space, it could be that that has to be at night when the kids are in bed or whatever. But kind of um, defining my days has really helped me keep the balance going and um, being super organized for me like during the summer things got chaotic like I was like I don't have the energy y'all go play and <laughs> things got so chaotic um and I was fine with it because it was the summertime the kids had their freedom but since school has started back what has really been helping me is organization like I have timers on my phone for all of their stuff because otherwise I feel like I'm constantly scrambling to keep up. And once yeah. you get into scramble mode, like it, it, it drives you crazy. It wears you out, you know? So having my, my, my timers and knowing I have like this, yes, <laughs> yes. Timers <laughs> like that and having the kids schedule pinned up and, you know, being super organized. I had one of those little Ikea locker things that I, I have for my son. So he has this little locker with all of his school stuff organized. That has been really helpful for me. And my kids are four and eight. So the eight-year-old has responsibilities. That's the other thing is like, if your kids are old enough, give them responsibilities, delegate take some stuff off of your plate, <laughs> yes. you know? So he has to make his bed. He has to vacuum the floor. You know, he has chores on a daily basis to help take things off of my plate in addition to help teach him responsibility, you know? So I've kind of had to try to create these systems. One of them is separation. Like when I'm in mom mode, I'm in mom mode. When I'm in creative mode and my husband takes over the parenting side, I can be in creative mode. Otherwise, you're constantly fighting against yes. whatever's happening. If you're with the kids and you're trying to create something, it's going to be a battle. You can't focus on both at the same time. So that's how I've had to find balance. It's by compartmentalizing, Thanks. you know, yes, so that I can be focused on one thing at a time. Totally agree. Totally agree. Thank you for that, Gia. Well, this has been a great episode and it's so nice and fun to chat with you again. I'm glad you're able to join us today. But before we wrap up, please tell us where we can find your beautiful art and your classes, of course. Sure. So I'm um, on Instagram. I am Gia Graham. 
Um, I do sell some of the work that you see on Instagram. I do sell as prints on Society6. Um, so you can look for me on Society6 and on Skillshare. And everything that I'm doing, I have an email newsletter where I share my palettes every month. Um, I don't share the hex codes on Instagram anymore. I only do it through my email newsletter. So sign up for that if you're looking for palette inspiration. Um, and the links for everything are in my Instagram bio. Yes. And we are also going to have all of those links in the show notes. So be sure to subscribe to the podcast because you will get the weekly notification for when we release new episodes just like this. And also, I, if I would be, you know, I, I am going to go ahead with this and I would love to talk to you again, like after the sure. show. Sure. <laughs> Anytime. You like, okay, so I'm just going to quickly hop on my host mode again <laughs> and get on okay. it. I'd yeah. love if you guys, I'm so sorry, like we just casually talk really. <laughs> if you can leave a review on iTunes because your reviews help the podcast get found by other creatives who are in need of inspiration just like you and me. And as always, keep creating and stay confident. Until next time, this is Mai. Thank you so much, Gia. Thank you. Bye, guys. Thanks, Mai.